so my name is Paula Tapata and my project is on the characterization of fluorescent pr proteins produced in an Escherichia coli cell-free protein synthesis system to decrease level detection in point of care sy systems. So the objective of my project was to find the brightest and most robust fluorescent protein to be expressed in an E. coli CF CFPS system. So there's a huge problem right now that heavily diluted samples containing analyte, analyte meaning a substance or sample being analyzed, is very high cost and process and many sensors cannot be ac both accurate and robust, robust meaning strong. So for example, if you're taking a sample of your urine, saliva, or blood, if you're looking for a substance, it may be too diluted to be able to test, so you come up with false negative or false positive results. Therefore, I'm trying to categorize and characterize different types of fluorescent proteins to find which one is the brightest and most robust in different environments, which that will cause to lower limits of detection, lower cost, and also an all-encompassing reading of the source. So how I characterize my fluorescent proteins were by their brightness, their maturation time, so how well the proteins could fold, their crowded environments, and the temperature, so whether the proteins made in a colder or warmer temperature worked better. And the four different types of fluorescent proteins I tested were GFP, EGFP, SFGFP, and MNG. And as we'll see later, MNG was actually the best of all four of the proteins. So some background information. The cell-free protein synthesis system, also known as CFPS, is a new type of powerful platform which is used for high yielding protein production and also genetic circuit characterization. And it's also an in vitro platform optimal for sensing because since it's cell free, it doesn't need to focus on cell production or microcubule growth. And instead can only can just put its focus on the growth of our interest of the fluorescent proteins. And this type of system will use the fluorescent proteins often to generate signals for a genetic circuit center. And I decided to go with E. coli because E. coli is very low maintenance. We don't need to worry about it that much. And it also allows for a low reaction cost and a high protein yield. Fluorescent proteins have been used as markers of genes and used for localization. And it, this image below is actually an image of the proteins we grew, like the fluorescent proteins that we had in our lab. And some different types of materials and methods I used in my experiment was a cell extract preparation protocol made by Dr. Kwan. And it was a four day process in which I would grow the E. coli cell heart culture. Once it grew to an amount I liked, it was a harvest. And then we did a cell lysase and we had to do two um, clarification process. So we did the clarification, then we had to put it in an incubator. And then we did a second clarification in which you'd put it in a centrifuge and it'll mix up till it became clarified. And then we got our finalized cell extract. We also had to do a plasma purification because whenever we receive the fluorescent proteins, they're in a plasma form. And once we did a plasma purification, it separated the bacterial DNA and the plasmids. And we would use the plasmid and the cell extract to put it together with some amino acids to create the CFPS reaction. Once all those were put together, it would begin to create the actual fluorescent proteins, which would be used. Lastly, to check the fluorescence of our proteins, we use a fluorescence spectroscopy. And that is whenever it analyzes fluorescence from a substance and it uses a beam of light to excite the electrons to be able to emit light. And it'll read the light emitted to see the fluorescence of each of the proteins. So my results from this project, I tested the maturation time, which again is how it measured the rate and how fast the proteins were able to fo fold. And the bolded lines right here are how the proteins made in 30 degrees Celsius and the dotted lines show the proteins made in a 37 degrees Celsius. And as you can see in the green one, M neon green had the best rate and quickest folding time than all the other proteins, which is quite odd because SFGFP, the SF stands for super folder. So you'd believe that that would be the best one, but no, it was actually M neon green or MNG. And also the GFP obviously was the least amount of all of them. And then the second one, we tested the crowding effects on fluorescence. So we put a crowding agent called PEG and we put it inside of the four fluorescent proteins that we tested. 
and the light green stands for the crowding whenever we add a peg and the dark green is whenever it was just the brightness of the fluorescent proteins overall. And as you can see, M neon green again did the best. It had the best fluorescent protein and it, the, whether you put a crowding agent or not wasn't that significant for the proteins except for M neon green whenever made in a colder temperature. And we could also finalize that the proteins made in a colder temperature had a much better folding time and brightness overall than those made in a warmer temperature. So in conclusion, the significance of my results is by finding the brightest protein and its optimal conditions, it will allow for a, an ability to do a low concentration analyte, so example, dilute patient biopsies. And what we learned that M neon green was the brightest and most robust protein, so those are the best to be used and the cell free proteins in the system. And what I'd like to do is for the next time, I'd like to use a better plasmid purification method for my proteins because we use a type of mini kit, but we would definitely like, I would definitely like to use a better purification method to make sure I have the purest form of the plasmids I use. And for future research, I would like to test pH, so another type of environment that could put effect on how bright the proteins could be. And I'd also like to optimize for a transcription translation capacities, such as an RBS footprint, and test different types of RNA polymerases to allow for an expanded form of genetic circuitry toolboxes to be able to test more things. And these are my work cited. All right, thank you, Paula. Um, I'll move to questions. Uh, Dr. Constant? Get un unmuted there. Oh, it's down here. It moved on me. Uh, so, in your recommendations, there is some. Uh, are these major changes, or is this? Is are these major improvements or minor improvements to what you did? Um, these are minor improvements to what I did because the plasma purification method I did use was great but there's also a better form that it could have used, but it wouldn't create that big of a significant change to the results. Okay, and then the pH you were at, did you, was it, you say optimize more environmental conditions? Yes. So by, that for me? so by testing the pH, we'd be able to see, because whenever we were testing the different like maturation and crowding agents, we were testing to see how well it could work in different types of environmental settings. And by testing pH, it would just allow for another type of test to see if M neon green was actually the best of all of them. And just to see if it can work in any type of situation, whether it has a high pH or low pH. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Good job. Thank you. Dr. Lima. Yeah, Paula, again, that was a really nice presentation. And I especially like your last slide because um, it is told like a story. And I, I do think that research is like a story. There's there's what you, you start with a question, uh, you try to answer that question and, and you come up with um, with more questions as a result. So I, I really like the way you, you, set, you set up your presentation. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Why is protein folding time important? Um, protein folding time is important because the actual folding of the protein is what allows for the function of the protein. So if the proteins aren't folding very well, then the amount that they can do their function will be limited. So they wouldn't be able to fluoresce as well then and they wouldn't yes. be effective. Okay. Um, with your E. coli, the way that you were growing E. coli, uh, how did you do that? So at first we First, we would streak the E. coli cell extract that we receive onto a plate, and then we would let it grow to about three millimeters in diameter. Once we did that, we would take a piece of the colony that we had, and we would put it so that it could harvest, and we would put it inside, and it would harvest, and we would take out the harvest later, and then we would begin the cell lysis, which would break down the membranes, and then we'd put it into a centrifuge to it could clarify everything that we needed and take out all the products that were unnecessary for the project. 
And then after that, we would put an incubator and do a second clarification to make sure we got everything that we needed. Okay, so that first part of your process, the cell culture, you were doing that with, uh, with auger plates or were you doing it in, um, with a beaker like you're showing? Uh, with a beaker. With a beaker, okay. Um, so what did you learn about yourself from doing this research project this summer? Um, honestly, I kind of learned that I was kind of impatient because we weren't <laughs> getting the plasmids. It took like an extra week and a half to get the plasmids. And so like, we always like wanted to keep on moving. But since we weren't receiving the plasma, I could tell myself that I was getting antsy and impatient about it. But I also learned about myself that I'm able to think outside of the box because once I started testing, I began like opening new doors and realizing, oh, I can test this and this and just like wanting new ideas to come in. Okay. Thank you.